Lecture 3.1 Beneficiaries of Competition Initial reaction to the assertion that competition benefits the poor is likely to be disbelief, actually scoffing disbelief. Our sports imbued culture thinks of competition in terms of winners and losers. And since the poor are obviously losers, having drawn the short straw in the grand scheme of things, it must logically follow that competition is bad for them. Plus, it just seems unfair. Why should they have to compete when they're already at a disadvantage? Closer examination reveals that competition in sports, the win-lose type of competition, isn't descriptive of competition in markets, competition that has win-win outcomes. In teaching about competitive markets, we need to remember that students' mental model of competition is likely to be the sports model. We need to acknowledge it and then teach them a new one, the win-win model, in order to make a convincing argument for the beneficial effects on everyone in an economy of allowing markets to allocate resources, goods, and services. I think that we have a tendency in teaching economics to consider competition as a kind of in addition to topic when we explain how equilibrium emerges from the interaction of supply and demand or when we invoke Adam Smith's invisible hand in an attempt to convince skeptical students that corporations can't pick our pockets at will. I'd suggest reconsidering this approach and elevating the topic of competition from a footnote to a bold topic heading. And the heading belongs first in the chapter on scarcity, not in the chapter on markets. If we conceive of competition in the sports framework, then it seems clear that competition causes scarcity. The loser goes home empty-handed. This type of competition is known as rivalry. There's a winner and there's a loser. But that's not economic competition. The competition of Adam Smith's invisible hand is non-rivalrous or what economists call win-win competition. In this kind of competition, scarcity is the cause rather than the effect. Acknowledging the reality of scarcity means logically accepting that we must have some way to determine who gets what. Simple statement, but the implications are of paramount importance. First is recognition that because competition results from scarcity, we could only eliminate competition by eliminating scarcity. And that's not going to happen. So, competition is as much a reality of human existence as is scarcity. It seems obvious when we lay it out that way, but we often speak and argue as if competition were a choice or a method of exploitation that some, often labeled capitalists, uses to take advantage of others. That people compete for scarce resources is not a choice. It's a universal condition of human existence. Second, then, competition exists in all economies, all systems of allocation, not just in capitalism. Paul Hain, author of The Economic Way of Thinking, explains it very clearly. Competition is the unavoidable accompaniment of scarcity and will consequently be found in every human society, whatever the form of its economic organization. The question is not whether we shall have competition, but what forms it will take. That will be determined by the criteria used to allocate scarce goods. The criteria in a market system are usually monetary. People compete largely by offering to pay more money for what they want to obtain and by agreeing to accept less money for what they are trying to supply. There are, of course, alternative methods of allocation but they do not eliminate competition, they merely change its form. Competition occurs when people strive to meet criteria that are being used. Of course, criteria used do make a difference. If a society rations on the basis of willingness to pay money, members of that society will strive to make money. If it uses physical strength as a primary criterion, members of the society will do bodybuilding exercises. Accepting the necessity of competition in some form means that students' thinking opens up to consideration of a more fruitful inquiry. Since we must compete for scarce resources, what form of competition is most compatible with the goals we have for our society? At that point, 
we can begin to consider how different institutions, different sets of rules of the game, can produce different kinds of competition. As we mentioned earlier, we're most familiar with rivalry, the win-lose form of competition institutionalized in sports. Market competition sets up different incentives and conditions that allow for win-win outcomes. Remember that institutions are the rules of the game, and the institution of competitive markets has only one rule of consequence. All transactions must be voluntary. Deceptively simple, but amazingly powerful because of the incentives it creates for participants in the market. Let's revisit the nature of market We often make the mistake of thinking that buyers and sellers in markets do battle with each other. But reconsider for a moment. When you go to the car dealership to buy a new car, it may feel like you're doing battle with the salesman, but are you? No, the salesman wants to sell you a car at least as much as you want to buy one. Neither of you wins if you keep your old car. Both of you win if you reach an agreement. So, despite the sometimes combative atmosphere, you both have strong incentives to cooperate in making a buyer-seller exchange. So, where's the competition? Yours is the person who might come in the door next, or tomorrow, willing to pay more than you are. His is the dealer down the block, who's offering a little lower price, bigger rebate, or longer warranty. That's right. Buyers and sellers don't compete with each other. Buyers compete with other buyers, trying to pay the least they can without losing the purchase to another buyer. And sellers compete with other sellers, trying to sell for as much as they can without losing the sale to another seller. Buyers and sellers in voluntary exchanges, remember that that's an essential qualifier, voluntary depend on each other in order to benefit. One doesn't benefit at the expense of the other. Thus, this market set of rules creates win-win competition. Every completed market transaction results in both the buyer and the seller being better off. Each has voluntarily given up something of lesser value for something he values more. The model of scarcity-induced competition producing win-win outcomes through markets certainly seems to work in the developed world. We've seen the data in the form of growing GDP and rising standards of living. But it seems a reasonable question to ask what the implications of that model are for the present and future well-being of the world's poor. The evidence is clear. Throughout history and continuing into the present day, Competitive market economies have the best record of reducing poverty and elevating overall standards of living. They do this by conferring benefits on the poor as consumers and as workers. Here's how. First, competition benefits poor consumers by making more goods and services available at lower prices. Because sellers' incentive is profit, they want buyers to buy. They compete with other sellers by improving quality or service, or, most often, by offering a lower price, whatever it takes to get buyers to purchase from them instead of from another seller. True, sellers want the highest price they can get, but the presence of other sellers wooing the same buyers means that they can't, quote, take advantage of the poor by setting whatever price they choose. Neither can they relax after they've offered a price low enough to make the sale, because, right, because there's another seller trying to figure out how to charge less and get the next customer. Sellers are engaged in a constant search for lower cost so that they can lower their prices and keep their current customers while attracting new ones who used to buy from other sellers. This is good news for consumers, especially poor ones who arguably benefit the most from reductions in the prices of goods and services. We can even show this relationship in terms of a person's time, not just in lower prices. This graph shows the effect of competition among sellers in terms of the change in the labor time necessary to purchase common American household items. For example, the graph tells us that a person who had to work 100 hours to afford a color TV in 1954 would only have to work 4.1 hours to afford one today. 
And that doesn't even take into account how much better quality the TV would be. The second piece of good news for consumers is that the relentless real or potential competition among sellers provides incentives for some to pursue innovation, finding better, lower cost ways to make goods and services, or inventing ways to meet ongoing needs and wants with new products. The result, again, is that things become more accessible to the The color TV mentioned above is a case in point. In 1954, only the well-off in America had color televisions. In 2001, virtually all U.S. households officially classified as poor had color television sets. This is a dynamic that can work everywhere, not just in the United States. Think what it would mean if we got to a level of world development where we classified people as extremely poor even though they had color television. In addition to pushing prices down and making more products available, market competition provides opportunities for the poor as workers and entrepreneurs. The growth that accompanies markets creates jobs, and as producers compete for workers, wages rise. This starts an encouraging upward spiral. Higher wage levels allow workers to gain more human capital through experience and through education. In the long run, this increase in human capital and productivity is even greater as improved circumstances and higher incomes for parents tend to sharply reduce child labor, which in turn results in more children in school, which in turn means that children enter the labor force with more capital, etc. The impact of higher family incomes in reducing child labor is clearly documented in developing countries. Finally, we should not make the mistake of assuming that because people are poor, they aren't risk takers or don't have talent and ideas. Open competitive markets also create incentives for entrepreneurship, and research shows that they attract budding entrepreneurs at all income levels. The case study at the end of the curriculum outline three and the teacher's guide to the more the merrier activity that accompanies the lesson describe how even the minimal opening of markets in rural China gave poor farmers the opportunity to become fledgling entrepreneurs, boosting the economic growth that reduced poverty by hundreds of millions in the past decade. Remembering that competition is not a one-size-fits-all institution, it's appropriate to return to the continuum of practice structure we set up in the institutional definition of capitalism. Like the other institutions we've investigated, markets are characterized by different degrees of competition. On the more capitalist end of the spectrum are highly competitive, relatively unregulated markets wide open to entry and exit. Toward the other end are those hampered by regulation or restrictions to entry. The degree of competition in any particular market is influenced by a number of factors some the result of the inherent characteristics of the product being exchanged, and others the result of how the society set up the rules of the game. In general, the competitiveness of the market for a particular product is a function of the number of firms in the market. The bigger the number, the more competitive the market is. Secondly, the relative ease of entry and exit, which may be a function of the product itself, it takes a lot of money to start an airplane manufacturing firm, for example, or it may be the product of the rules of the game. Teachers, doctors, lawyers, etc. are required to earn licenses. Third factor is the number of substitutes and the ease of obtaining them. Agricultural markets, for example, tend to be very competitive, one farmer's wheat being little different than his neighbor, while markets for a specialty product may be less competitive. And finally, the availability of information about the market and the level of consumers' access to that information. Nobody ever buys tires that aren't on sale because it's so easy to find out where they are on sale. Looking at the larger picture, the level of competitiveness of an economy as a whole is a function of the institutional framework, the formal and informal rules of the game set up by government and by culture and custom. Some countries' economies are highly competitive. Others claim to have markets, but regulatory restriction prevents the beneficial effects of competition from occurring. 
Generally speaking, the factors that determine the degree of competitiveness and therefore the extent to which a nation's markets work to raise the standards of living of the poor include, one, the extent to which property rights of both buyers and sellers are clearly defined and secured. Two, the extent of the rule of law. Three, the extent to which law and regulation obstruct voluntary exchange. And note that this can happen even in a democracy. And four, the extent to which there is a free flow of information, including consumers' access to market information and producers' ability to disseminate product information. Closely related to the issue of market information is the quality and quantity of a nation's infrastructure. A market may be completely open to entry and exit and still function poorly because the lack of phone access and highways hampers communication and transportation. And last but not least, the level of openness of entry into and exit from the market. Barriers to entry and exit may be formal and legal, such as licensing requirements, or extra-legal, such as gang intimidation. In summary, there is strong evidence, both historical and contemporary, of the efficacy of attempts to alleviate poverty by allocating scarce resources, goods, and services through markets, rather than through another form of competition. Most compelling are examples like that of the former Soviet Union, where privatization of garden plots helped to stave off mass starvation in the waning years of the communist regime. And contemporary China, where reforms initiated in 1978 set off a remarkable surge of economic growth. And these results were achieved in countries that would still be identified as less capitalist on our institutional continuum. Which brings us to an important caveat. Markets and competition do generate productivity gains, and they do grow the economic pie. But opening markets to competition does not by itself guarantee that the wealth created by economic growth will be distributed to everyone. Depending on the configuration of a nation's political and social institutions, increased national income may be accompanied by greater income inequality. On the flip side, however, we must recognize that when calls for greater income equality have constrained markets, the economic pie has grown more slowly, and the poor, along with all other segments of the population, have advanced more slowly than in nations that have tolerated some degree of income inequality. In market economies, access to clean water and adequate housing and food has moved millions out of absolute poverty, even where significant relative poverty or income inequality still remains. Nations decide whether and to what degree that trade-off is acceptable. In summary then, we can add competitive open markets to the list of capitalist institutions that can help to lift the poor out of misery. The evidence of the 20th century is in. From nations as diverse as the Soviet Union, Uganda, Vietnam, India, and China, markets with high levels of competition effectively reduce poverty. As you return to the assignments and the curriculum CD, note that the Lesson 3 outline entitled Beneficiaries of Competition includes a detailed case study of China's institutional reforms, showing the power of competitive markets even within the constraints of the rule of man to generate wealth and to make significant inroads into poverty. The accompanying classroom activity, The More the Merrier, let students experience for themselves the win-win results generated by opening markets to competition.